Right subject is God only acts. And you may ask, how could a mortal man born as we were born, and who will die as we will die, know it? If I tell you, I know it from experience. I tell you in the cause I sent you, and this is of the Word of God. I have experienced the Word of God. But tonight I will tell you, and I will tell you from my own first experience how I know that God alone acts. The name of God is the key to understanding the biblical doctrine of God. In biblical terms, the question is not that God exists, but who is our God? What is His name? And what is His Son's name? For Israel, the personal name of God is I am. You can read that in scripture. I read the scripture. But I didn't know it until I experienced it. Now let us go back tonight to an experience of mine that took place in 1929. It was in the summer of 29. Before I quote the passage from the 82nd Psalm, let me say that the error of the most scholarly of all higher criticisms of scripture, Thomas K. Chase, he was the editor of the Encyclopedia Biblical. And you will find this statement concerning the book in both the American, that is the great dictionary, the American dictionary, and the great British dictionary called Britannica. That it is by far the most scholarly of all higher biblical criticisms. And this is what he said of the 82nd Psalm. He said, it makes the strongest demand on the historical imagination of the interpreter. The ideas may be perennial, but the outer forms are no longer understood. So let me quote the passage in the song that disturbed this great professor. He was the outstanding biblical professor of the day at Oxford University, a master of the Hebrew tongue. He interpreted the entire Old Testament from the original script. And here is this master in his day, the giant, and he still considered his book of Psalms, as we have in our library, he still considered tops in translation. When he said it's the greatest demand of all Psalms on the historic imagination of the interpreter. He confesses the ideas there may be critical, but so they are. But then he says, as far as understanding them, God will be for God to man. Now there are two verses in the very short song that disturb the great professor. The first and the sixth. The first is this. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds just. That's the first verse. In the sixth, I say you are gods. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like men. I fall as one man, O princes. You read it in your 82nd Psalm. Now the crux of the 
his revelation hangs upon the meaning that the interpreters will give to the word Elohim. And may I tell you, I have made so many commentaries, I have many exegesis at home, and they differ wide. Yet the word Elohim is simply stated in Scripture as God. It's a plural word. It first appears in the very first verse of Genesis. And God says, or in the beginning, God, at the first time of faith, singular, yet the word is plural. In the 26th verse, it reappears, and here we find the word now, plural. And God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. Here we find it now in its plural form. In this 82nd Psalm, the word Elohim appears twice in the first verse, and then in the sixth verse. In the first verse, and God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, as plural, he holds God. For the historic imagination is concerned only with the facts of secular history. There is no record on earth, even though no history book agrees with another history book of the same events. Still, they were facts. We know that the battle of Waterloo was fought. We know the Civil War here was fought. The First and Second World War were fought. And now we find it out. But no historian, in telling the story of these events, will tell it in the same manner. They will see it through different eyes, but they're recording facts. I say, in the midst of changing theories and opinions of men in secular history, stands the unchanging word of God. Sacred history is over. It's finished. The time is fulfilled now for it to be fulfilled in us. So sacred history is a book. Sacred history, a changing thing that will tomorrow fade and vanish like the grass. It will wither like the grass and vanish and fade like the flowers. No matter how big a nation is today, it will tomorrow vanish. No matter how big you are, you will run down and beat like some footsteps on the little sand as the waves come in. But salvation history is forever. So in the midst of these changing theories and opinions of secular history stands the unchanging salvation history of God. This is literally true. I just quoted you from the 82nd Psalm. I experienced it in the summer of 1929. Now here is my experience of this, and I know that God only acts. So when Blake wrote that memorable fantasy of his called the marriage of heaven and hell, he was exercising his right as a poet, but he says, God only acts and eats in existing beings only. And when he advances into Jerusalem, it is greatest of all poets, and he says, let us to him who only is and who walks among us give decision. The only act is God. God alone acts and there is the last. Now do you remember what I say that I quoted that passage from the 82nd? I say you are gods. Sons of the most high. All of them. Nevertheless, you will die like me. And fall as one man, all princes. Now God takes his place in the divine castle. And in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Is this simply true? But well, the great scholars up to this day cannot, by their historic imagination, encompass that thing. They can. Until it's revealed, they cannot, by all of their knowledge of the tongue, or the Hebrew tongue, or the Greek tongue, or any tongue of which this thing was revealed, they cannot grasp 
It is not part of the fact of secular life. But here is my experience. I was a dinosaur in that day. It was just before the great financial crash that enveloped our country for almost 12 years. We didn't come out of it until the Second World War. And everything collapsed. But I was a successful dancer. Successful in part, or in making money. And fully my own, I was sound asleep in my hotel room in New York City. When I was taken in spirit into this divine council. Now the phrase translated divine council, if you look up the word, in the King David Version, they translate that as the congregation of the mighty, the mighty ones. You go further, and it is called the synagogue, the church. He stands in this church, the synagogue, the synagogue being the assembly of the mighty ones. Those who are called by name, the called one by name. And they ordered and commanded by word. It's the point place motion proceeds. You're going to be actually safe after your call. I'm giving you now the definitions of the word that's given to us in the biblical concordance, which is Strong's Concordance. The mighty one. Well, I aided this wonderful assemblage of mighty ones. I saw what? The personification of infinite might. Others were around. All the assemblage of the God. I was taken to this heavenly woman. And there she was with an enormous ledger. Open. She was seated. I stood at her left side. She turned and looked me into the eyes. She didn't say one word. I said nothing. I simply looked. And she looked as though she looked for confirmation. For the word is that call one's by me. And she looked. And she looked back at the bed. And with a long quill pen, there she either painted or checked off. I do not know which. I knew she made a motion on the ledger as she looked at me. Then I was taken before God, the risen Christ, infinite love. And I stood before him, I felt nothing but love. And he asked the most simple question in the world. What is the greatest thing in the world? And I answered in the word for faith, hope, and love. These things. But the greatest of these is that. And with that, he embraced it, refused, and became one body. Not two, one. In for love, I wore the human form divine, which is God. Fused with God, and no one can put us asunder. At that moment, I was one with God, and no power in the world can separate me from the love that is God, with which I am fused. We were in the same body. As I was embraced, a voice out of space came, and the voice said, Down with the blue light. I heard the voice, but I saw no face. And then I found myself before the embodiment of might. The mighty ones now gathered as one. When God first reveals himself to men, he reveals himself as God Almighty. Did I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, which is I am, I did not make myself known unto them. 
So here I stood before God in his appearance as Almighty God. He that commune with me as God in the appearance of love. Didn't ask any questions. Now comes the order as the word mighty God is translated in the concordance. He doesn't ask me anything. He commands it. And the words were time to act. And then I was pushed out of that divine assemblage and found myself back in the secular world of man. Where I knew I was born there and I will die here. I didn't know then that I searched the scriptures, that it was the fulfillment of the 82nd Psalm. I say you are God's sons of the Most High, all of them, but you will die like me and fall as one man over you. So I said earlier that the name of God is the key to the interpretation of the doctrine of God in the Bible. And to Israel, that name is I. So the word of the Lord, and he reveals himself to the state called Moses, is I am. Say unto them, I am the Savior. But how do I know I am the Savior? But I saw it. Is this really I am? He said, me. Who did he say? He said, me. Well, who is this mighty one that sent me? He was mighty. And here I am told it contains all the gods. And you and I fell. Listen to the words. You will fall as one man open. Now the word, Yahweh Valte, which we translate I am. Its primary meaning is to fall, or to cause to fall, or to blow, or to cause the wind to blow. That's the primary meaning of the word Yahweh Valte. We must forget that when we read scripture. Here is one being, meaning all of us. And the one who fell calls the fall. This is no afterthought. All three eternity. The way that God expects. So the one God containing the gods, all of us, unto the most high, fell. Fell and caused the fall. Hundred that he could paint the power to rise from this world of sin and death. And the first comes out, and then the second comes out, and the third comes out. With one in the beginning, there will be one in the end. We are gathered one by one, O people of Israel, as we are told in Isaiah. I gather you one by one, O people of Israel. So we're all gathered back in the same oneness that we were before the fall, but enhanced infinitely by the experience of the fall into the world of sin and death. So everyone here, and I look at you, seem so insane I say you are not. All of us. Sons of the Most High. Yes, nevertheless, you will die. Like me, who doesn't die here the land. I fall as one man. The one drop fragmented into these infinite pieces. And then all are put together again to reform into the one man, this time transcending himself before the fall. So the word that came to me, time to act. So I say that everyone is the actor. The only actor in this world is God. God is playing all the cards. God is acting. A 
and it seems at moments a horrible part of the drama. At moments it's a pleasant part of the drama. And then you have moments where you're on the wing and nothing is happening. But at every moment God is acting. The most horrible situation in the world, only God is playing the part. And when I tell you it's sprung from a God that is love, it seems incredible that I have said before, the God of love. And the God of love embraced me. And I fused with it. And we not only became one, we are one. You can't see the body that I wear through mortal eyes. These eyes die. You will need other eyes to see the garment that I wear, for there's no divorce. There's no man put asunder what God has become. And we have brought that one by one and united with him. As we are told in scripture, he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So when you are united to the Lord, you are one spirit with him. And no man or organization can put asunder that which God has joined together. And we are joined to the oneness, one by one. So when he says, God only acts at ease in existing beings or men. This was not taken liberty, says the poet words with words. He saw a vision, and he told it in his own wonderful way, as he could really use words. I wish I had the talent in the world then to use words as written. For I could tell that same vision, but no more beautifully than he has told it. God only acts at ease in existing beings or men. He must have heard the identical word, time to act. Now, if you're here for the first time, you might wonder what were the words done with the blue lights. And because of your conditioned mind, you might think it means done with the social world. Has nothing to do with that. The blue blood throughout history has been church protocol. The external trappings of the world that is a substitute for religion. All the so-called outward trappings, all the darkness of the ritual deeds, this is called collectively the blue blood. Down to it, I did not receive my knowledge of scripture from any man in this world. And my authority to preach it is not from any organization in the world. It came as it did through Paul by a revelation of Jesus Christ. When he unveiled himself before me, I answered correctly and he embraced it. In fulfillment now of the gospel. And when they bring you into the synagogues before the rulers, do not be anxious how or what you want to answer. Or what you want to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. You're reminded of it. I heard no word. It came automatically, as though I had been so well rehearsed in what I ought to say. The famous moment in time comes for you to answer, like an actor stepping on the stage, he does it automatically. He doesn't take thought as to what he's going to say. So take no thought, do not be anxious how or what you're going to answer and what you're going to say. For the Holy Spirit will in that very hour teach you what you ought to say. And you say, divide the that you couldn't make a mistake. So no one is going to falter when they're brought into the great assemblage of the God. And so you will see only two, really, the others, but in the end, only two. The one who embraced you, the risen Christ, who is in the of God. And then the one who is the same presence, revealed only as much. God Almighty, El Shaddai. And that's all that he is, infinite light, without compassion. And the other, infinite love, nothing but compassion. And yet it's the same thing. So I have been unto Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, which is I am, 
I did not make myself known unto them. But beyond that comes the greatest revelation when he reveals himself as the Father. God is a Father with the heart of a Father. He could never be envious of a child, only be proud of his son. He could in any way hold back his son from a country. He would simply be proud of his son. So here we are, sons of the Most High. All of us, not one, will be lost. Not one in all my holy mind. Now here on this level, while we are in the world, see them. There must be some use I can put to this vision. For here, while I wait to be called into the divine assemblage, for no one knows, for he who fell is the one who calls for and he who blew is the one who calls the wind to blow. So he is the wind and the causer of the wind blowing. And that is God's elective love. The secret remains with God. No one knows this night where the wind, the uncertain nature of the wind's course. Who knows how it will come this night and breathe upon you. If it breathes upon you, you will weaken. You can't stop it. There's no resistance. You're taking it spirit into the divine assemblage. And so as the wind blows where it will, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And the very word wind and spirit are one in both Hebrew and Greek. The same word is used for both wind and spirit. And so no one knows where it's going to happen. And it comes in the same unpredictable manner. You don't know. It's so strange how it comes. Here I have the dancer, sleeping. And they suddenly, of all people, why should I be chosen? I was not a member of the church, not school, in what is called some religious training. And finally keep myself afloat without turning to others to help. And suddenly I am chosen. So the secret of God's elect itself remains his secret. And so it is simply a state, alright, we are called, as we are told in Romans, we are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, and he foreknew us all, then he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those who he predestined, he called. And those who he called, he justified. And those who we justified, he also glorified. Well, these five terms for you, predestined, called, justified, and glorified, add up to a very strong affirmation of predestination. And I know no way to take the five terms and interpret them to avoid the conclusion of predestination. You try it. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Glorification is a gift of himself to the one that he glorifies. Justification is divine and real. No matter what you've done in the world of Caesar and what has to be done, no man is without sin, but no man. No man can say he has violated the commandments of God. Especially when we read that they must be done psychologically. Or you've heard it say you must not commit adultery. But I say, the one who looks lustfully on a woman has already committed the act of adultery with her in his heart. For what man is not guilty? What woman is not guilty, if I take the name man generically, what individual in this world is not guilty of violating that command? Yet he will justify it. And in justifying, vindication is divine vindication. And the minute you are completely vindicated by the embrace of him, you are glorified in his presence. You are one with God. From then on you are two, you are only one. So on this level, we take that command, 
time to act. And then you read scripture. Drink no more water. Take a little wine for your stomach's sake, and you're making a thirsty. Water is a psychological symbol of psychological knowledge. It's a symbol of psychological knowledge. I come into the field and there's a well, and a stone covers the well. I roll the stone away and draw water and water my drop. Then I roll the stone back. The stone is a symbol of literal truth. The water is a symbol of psychological interpretation of the literal fact. Now I turn it into wine, as told us in the second chapter of John. I take the water, and I draw forth water, but the water doesn't come up, I draw wine. Wine is the application of the truth that I have heard. So if I have heard that I must repent, the very first word is repent. Well, repent is the change my attitude towards life, but change it radically. Well, if I see you and you're not well, I'm going to help you. I've got to ask you to wait by yourself that I've just seen the most wonderful embodiment of hell that I have ever encountered concerning you. And so persuade myself that that is fact, that when I meet you, when I think of you, I only see that. But I only see this new being in my mind's eye relative to you. For they, I am not drinking water anymore. I have applied it. I am now drinking wine, or the afflictions of my world. And so I go through life still be taking wine, having absorbed all the water I have taken. I have seen all the literal facts of life, turn them into the psychological truths that they represent. And then instead of absorbing more and more of these truths, stop it. Start now drinking a little wine. Start applying the little knowledge that you have. And so you go out to rethink, not to feel remorseful, not to feel regretful for anything you've done, but to see those in need, which is only your selfish self, or we are one. We started in the divine assembly, and we all fell as one man, and it became fragmented. And we all gather together again, still be one man. And that one man is God. There is only God. So while we are fragmented and think there is another, we are at war with self. Now I see an aspect of myself, and I have heard that he really isn't a devil, he really is but an aspect. But I don't want this little finger to be hurting me all the time. The whole body hurts. If I say, well, that's all, that doesn't matter, I cut it off. I am just simply chopping off a part of myself. So you read this card, no one of this world. We simply change the one that formerly we would have discarded. As something that could not be redeemed. Everything is redeemable. So we take every person in this world, I am changed them in our own mind, God. I am changed them in us, rather. We wait for a moment to find it conforming to the change that took place within us. And the whole vast world only mirrors and echoes the changes taking place in us. So we start simply drinking more and more water by absorbing more and more of the psychological meanings of Scripture, and we apply the will that we know the application is now drinking wine. So we will drink wine from now on and simply change our world to conform to the ideal that we would like to have in our world, the world in which we want to live. And that is act. Therefore, God only acts and is in existing beings or men. If you don't act upon what you have as knowledge, then God is simply asleep within you. As you're told in Scripture, rouse thyself. Why sleepest thou, O Lord? Awake! Do not cast us all forever. Wake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. If we don't act, we are asleep. And they invite us unto the dead. But to hear what we ought to do, and to do it, is to begin to, begin to stir and to become alive within ourselves. Why did everyone, I know this from experience, I am not theorizing, I am not psychically, I am telling you what I know from experience. I have experienced it. I have experienced the word of God. And I can tell anyone in this world what it feels like, not to the real extent that I would like to share it. What it feels like to have experienced it. 
to see how good it is. Everything here changes. All things fade. So there was one vision and they want two visions. One young man is suing his father for a part of a trust fund that is already 300 million. And the father already owns one billion. And he just wants to release his one penny off. And the boy is 31 years old. The father is now 76. He doesn't know near he is to where he travel. But he just wants one penny off it, taking off. And the son could use some of it. Belongs to the son. He'll have nothing. Money is not for that purpose, he thinks. Money is to hold on and it's best and to grow. And the old story in the Bible, oh foolish man, your soul is required of him this night. But he doesn't know it. So he holds on to a trust fund that his mother left, not only to him, but to his offspring. So he has offspring. And the three hundred, three and a half million has grown in 34 years to almost three hundred million dollars. He's been a very good steward, watching carefully, protecting it, and developing it. Thirty-four years, three and a half million is grown to three hundred million. But on one of the four, entitled to his portion of it, is asking for a portion, seven million, but seven million out of three hundred million when he's entitled to one fourth of it. And the father, he has to bring suit. To so your own father that you love, and I hope he does. In order to get him to call up what is his own. <laughs> and he is re resisting. So I say to you, all this will say, his billions will say, our fabulous world that we love so much, even all things. Like the grass, the grass will wither, and the flowers fade. But the word of God will remain true forever. This is the unchanging truth in the midst of these changing things in the secular world. So when they say it's God's day, or God is there to make a very permanent statement, it's so stupid. But you can't blame them, they have not experienced it. The very ones who made that bold affirmation are still gods. I say you are gods, not a few of you. Who will take on the life? I say, you are not sons of the Most High, all of them. Nevertheless, you will die like me. And you will fall as one man, all princes. If your princes and your father are the king, he is the king of kings. And collectively, we are the king, for the father and the son are one. So when we come back from our fragmented state in this world, and all gather together once more, we form the one God, there is only God. So when Blake was asked, what do you think of Jesus? He didn't hesitate. He said, Jesus is the only God. But then he quickly added, but so am I. And so are you. There is no division in God. Although the element is a lot, it's a plural word. And therefore it is a constant unity. One leader of others. It is still one. So when asked what is the greatest commandment, he didn't mention him or any one of them. He mentioned the confession of faith of the Israelites. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. If you take the words of ten words, they are the ten commandments. Here, O Israel. The Lord, our Lord, is one. And this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like to the first. Love thy neighbor as thyself. For there is no other. He's not really another. So here this night, I tell you from experience that God only acts. And he's so the most horrible act this night, it was God asleep. The most loving act is the same God in the act of waking. And the day will come, you and I will leave this world of sin and death and return where we were before, but our translucency is then in hand. We will expand it beyond what we were prior to our fall into this world which was a deliberate fault. 
wasn't an accident. It was something that was planned in the beginning. God's way of expansion was by self-elimination. He achieves his purpose by limiting himself to the limit called man, which is the limit of contraction. And then he breaks the shell and not only returns to what he was, but beyond by such contraction. So everyone will be saved. And there's only one second, and he's housed by the beast. God is our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation. And to God the Lord belongs escape from death. The 68th Psalm. To God the Lord belongs escape from death. And this world is the world of sin and death. So nevertheless, you shall die like me. This is the world. And fall as one man. Open. But because God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escape from death, and he who fell is within, then be assured of redemption. You cannot fail. No one can fail. Why not in the world of Caesar use what has been revealed to the nth degree in naked for yourself and those you love around you a more beautiful world? By act no longer of sorrow and bringing the psychological meaning of scripture, but putting it into practice by applying the to now. Now let us go into the south. From any school or any man. I shall read it now, having had the experience, only for confirmation of the experience. So my experience is parallel to scripture. No, are there any questions? Uh, now, would you explain uh, the 12th verse of the 15th chapter of Matthew? Shall I read it? Please do. Uh, especially the last part, the for whosoever hath. To him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, to him shall be taken away even that he hath, especially the last cause of person. If you do not know God's law and live by it, you may, like many in the world, think that what I have now I will keep it forever without application of a principle that sustains it. All things come into this world by an imaginal act. They are kept in being by the imaginal act. When that imaginal act, for unnumbered reasons, ceases to be, it vanishes from their world. The people today who have nothing for tomorrow will have much. Those who have, who will have nothing. Not because God is punishing anyone. It's a law. All things bear after their kind. It's one of those laws set up in the beginning, all the things bear out of time. So if I bring something into being and forget how I did it, and think of that is my security, I not the law by which I brought the proof into being, the peace starts bearing. You can take people today who made fortunes in the tools, the football school of England, which pays off a million dollars for a penny. For their life, they had nothing before, came to one million tax free. Before he dies, he has nothing. It wasn't tax. All that is tax free money. One million dollars. And it has been actually investigated. Before they go from this world, or they depart, they have nothing. Because they forgot if they ever knew how they brought it in. Some woman is excited when they lost themselves in the imaginal act of possession. And then he came back. But they couldn't relate the fact to the unseen cause that produced it. So they feed the funds and trash, not keeping it alive in their mind's eye. So all things come into this world by imaginal acts. They are sustained by these imaginal acts, and they vanish when the act ceases to be sustained. So him that hath, 
shall be given, and he knows how to keep it alive in this world. And the man who has not refuses to believe that he has anything to do with his that in this world. He thinks it's society. He wants the world to take care of him. And he thinks that the government owes him a living. He thinks that that one owes him a living. And everybody by himself owes him a living. And all of this will encourage him to believe that to get his vote. And then we have billions being paid out because the people who refuse to pull their own weight. And yet their weight is so simple by using their own wonderful imagination. Imagination is the divine body in every man. If he doesn't use it, well then he doesn't bear fruit. And he says back in actually believe that everybody owes him a living. And yet, as a man who would refuse his imagination, he brings it in, he may remember the imaginal cause of the physical effect he made. If he does, he's blessed. As you're told in the first song, Blessed is the man who rejoices in the law of the Lord, for in all that he does, he prospers. Well, what is the law of the Lord? It stated so simply in the 11th chapter of Mark. Whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you will receive it, and you will. Just as simple as that. Whatever you desire, don't consult a teacher or a priest or anyone that is good or bad. You desire, is that what you really want? The story is, whatever you desire, believe that you will receive it. And you will. Now, do I have that faith to believe that I have what reason and my senses derive? If I do, and it becomes a fact, am I going to forget the door by which I made it fast? If I do, well then, I'm not that to sleep, and I don't feel like to open the door to the Lord. So, if you bring something in, in this meeting of ours, I don't see them anymore. But we had a few of us who, on the basis of this law, went down to carry in one for an $87,000 and $12,000. I didn't have anyone to whom he could turn to raise one penny. He had no credit or a thousand dollars. He made eighty seven thousand dollars. Although he became the wealthy one in his own mind's eye. Another chap his hand with his coat with a bottle of ice when he heard the man confess for my vessel. He came back, took my hand, and said that he is misspent. He did not steal it by Without the consent of the one who loaned me this money, I invested it in business, thinking that it would be all right. So he said, I did not steal it now. Only the business failed. Now he wants his money. Do you think I can do what that man, and I say, that he did as a certain group? The same God in you, same God in me, same God in him, can do it. In one month, he made 54 thousand dollars. But they, both of them, made all this money, and they forgot the word of God, I would be very interested to find out how near they are to the end of the 87,000 or the 84,000. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very interesting to find out what they did with all this money. If you forget God's law and not delight in it, it's not you, you are the important one. You are the instrument through which God is acting. This little thing, this little mass, this little mass, as though I stepped on the stage playing another part, and no one knew me, because I wore a mask. And so God is that. God's not that. The mask can feed you under the hay. But God is him at a moment produced, and then all of a sudden it comes to an end. A man is carried away with his own little false image of himself. When the great is housed within him, it's the God of God. Now my time is set here, about this one. Last week you mentioned that you saw Abraham and there was a snake back there. I'm interested, what was the snake doing? I said last week that the characters of Scripture are not persons as you and I are persons. They are eternal states through which you would be a more than you passive. And I focused on Blake in speaking of the last chapter. But he said that when you read the Bible, it ought to be understood that the persons mercies of Abraham are not here yet. But the states signified by those names. The individuals 
being representatives or visions of those things, as they were revealed to mortal men in a series of divine revelations as they are written in the Bible. Now he made a confession. He said, these various states I have seen in my imagination. When seen at a distance, they appear as one man. As you approach, they are a multitude of nations. But I have had that similar experience. So I saw the state of Abraham. Abraham with this tall, majestic being, reclining or leaning against the trunk of a very gnarly oak. No leaves on the oak. And the limbs, nothing resembled the human brain more than the branches of this oak. All the convolutions of the brain seem to be personified, or rather, objectified in this tree. And wound around, all around the trunk of the tree was a serpent. Its head was human. Its face was human. And there he is looking not at Abraham, looking at me. With the widest expression that he would ever imagine. He seemed to be infinitely wise, as told in scripture. Of all God's creatures, he was the wisest. Abraham was looking off into the distance, not in space, but in time. In keeping with scripture, Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my age. He saw it and was glad. Abraham was given a preview of God's plan of salvation, as told us in Galatians. And that scripture, foreseeing, that God would justify the heathen by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand. So beforehand, if you take it chronologically, as though you were a person, as you're a person, it would be at least 2,000 years B.C. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, these are persons. These are states. They aren't found in any ancient history. There is no record of the Near East, where the names are mentioned either as individuals or as persons, or as uh, tribes. They appear only in Scripture. Scripture is not secular history. It is biblical history of salvation. It's all the history of salvation, God's plan of redemption. And these are the eternal states. But when you enter a state, the state becomes personified. So when I enter the state, of faith for Abraham is the state of absolute belief. He would heard and believe the most incredible story in the world. That Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. So you meet the state. But when you meet the state, it seems to you a person like yourself. So when you meet any of these characters of scripture, they are persons. They are infinite, eternal descendants. <laughs> God's eternal play is, and you can't run it out. Whether you believe it or not, one day everyone will encounter these things. You are a person, you are a God of self. But these are saints. Therefore you can say, honestly, before Abraham was, I am. This is the play. Scripture is the play. And you were the God before you fell, and now you fall. Not because of any mistake that you make, but by design. You fell by design. And then the one became the many. Frankly. And then you'll pass through these states. And the day will come you will encounter them. At a certain moment will make you. You will come to all these things. And know what they are. I don't have to ask when I meet any of these states who are them. It's so obvious who they are. So the serpent is so in the very beginning of Genesis. And the serpent said to the woman, Did God say that you would die? You will not surely die. He didn't correct God. He didn't say you will not. He said you will not surely die. But he allowed the statement, you will die. So I say, nevertheless, you will die like me. Yet you will not really die. Nothing dies. How can God die? And God is playing all the time. Every one of the world, every child born a woman. Well, he couldn't read, were it not that God, the very breath of life, is in him. He not only is the, the one who blows, he's the one who causes the wind to blow. You read. Well, that's God's 